Great. So hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us on our session today and our session today on behavioral science to foster diversity and equality. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us Professor Iris Bonet, who a number of you have already reached out to us and talked about over the number of years. So we're very happy to have her with us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am and haven't been to our webinars before, my name is Mary McLennan. I'm a behavioral scientist. I'm also a senior advisor in the executive office of the Secretary General, and I lead an initiative called the UN Behavioral Science Group, which I'll speak to you very briefly in a few moments. Before I do that, and just while colleagues are joining, I would like to speak very briefly about UN Behavioral Science Week. So if you're with us today, there's a good chance you've seen the agenda, but if you haven't, I would encourage you to check it out. It brings together 18 entities in 21 sessions. So um, there are many more to come throughout the week. So please check out the agenda. Um, the sessions range from health, climate, peace and security, gender, as we're talking, we'll be speaking a bit about today. So no matter where you're approaching behavioral science from, I think there's something for you in this agenda. I will also note as well that all of these sessions are free and open to all. You do not need to be in the UN to attend these sessions, so feel free to join us as well as to share with if your colleagues in your networks. So before we get to our content for today, I just wanted to speak very briefly about the UN Behavioral Science Group. As I mentioned, it's the initiative I lead. It's an initiative of the UN Innovation Network and is supported by the Executive Office of the Secretary General. And what we do is we bring together over a thousand colleagues from across the UN, from over 60 entities in 110 countries. So there's no shortage of enthusiasm for behavioral science in the UN. Um, and colleagues in this group range from those who are getting started and really thinking about how to conceptualize behavioral science in a project or, uh, or in their work just to think through what principles perhaps might be relevant through to colleagues who are actually behavioral scientists themselves so we have a wide spectrum that said most are at that early stages of their of their journey so uh, a lot of what we do is really catered and support to support those those individuals but uh, we do have a spectrum across the un system overall uh, for those of you who've been following behavioral science in the UN over the last few years, you may have heard us speak about the UN Secretary General's remarks regarding the importance of behavioral science to really address the issues of today and tomorrow. Uh, the Secretary General has come out to say behavioral science is a critical tool for the UN to progress on its mandates, also encourages entities to invest in this, in this area, as well as for colleagues to work together in a collaborative and interagency way, which is what we're doing in the UN Behavioral Science Group. If you want to know more about the Secretary General's vision for behavioral science, I would encourage you to check out the UN Secretary General's guidance note, which was released last year. It covers a lot more detail in terms of um, what Secretary General sees for behavioral science and where things are heading. As well, it's important to note here that um, behavioral science is part of this quintet of change, which is part of the Secretary General's vision for the next five years in his term as Secretary General. It's called Our Common Agenda. So just to say, behavioral science has been highlighted in a number of um, important documents and vision statements of the Secretary General going forward. So if you have questions or comments, feel free to get in touch with us because we are leading the initiative in that space overall. Also, I would like to, excuse me, I'd like to draw your attention to a guide that we're launching this week, which again is in response to discussions we've had across the UN, meeting entities where they are, really that getting started stage with behavioral science. So this guide was developed by the UN system for the UN system. Um, many colleagues have engaged with us, provided comments and input. We're very grateful and, and thankful for that. I would like to say as well, this is based on the work of governments, academia, international organizations um, over the last decades since this field has really come into to prominence. So, um, uh, and then we've tailored that to the UN context. So it's not a whole new framework. We're really trying to build off what, what's already taken place in, over the last number of years and tailor it to the UN. So we'll put that in the chat for you as well. And then lastly, a bit of a call to action. Um, so if you'd like to get more engaged with our work across the UN, I'd encourage you to read the Secretary General's guidance note, the guide, as I mentioned, as well as the UN Behavioral Science Report we've released, which outlines the experiences of 25 UN entities, as well as some enablers for behavioral science in the UN. Also, I would encourage you to join the UN Behavioral Science Group. So as mentioned, we're over a thousand individuals in the UN, uh, but if you are outside the UN, you are also very welcome to join as an observer. Uh, we have observers from governments, academia, private sector, NGOs, other international organizations. So lots of, of colleagues there, and there will keep you up to date on what we're doing and uh, provide opportunities to engage with us as they rise. And then lastly, if you're interested in more real time um, updates on the UN behavioral science work, encourage you to follow us at UN underscore BSI or UN innovation, which under excuse me, UN underscore innovation, which is 
uh, the UN Innovation Network more broadly to hear about other initiatives. So with that, I will stop and go on to the session for today. Um, so the session is pretty relatively straightforward. We'll hear from our speaker for about 15 minutes, and then we'll open to, to questions from all of you and maybe a few from myself. Um, so how we'll be collecting questions is in the Q&A box. So do not put your questions in the chat because I won't be checking that as frequently. So please put them in the Q&A box. Even if you don't have a question yourself, I encourage you to check out the Q&A box so you can vote the questions of your colleagues so we can ensure our discussion today is really one that resonates with the audience that's here. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to put them in the chat too. Um, I'll be there. My colleague Johanna, who runs the Innovation Network, will be there as well. And now on to our speaker for today. So as I mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of interest in this topic and this individual joining us in the UN. So we're very fortunate to have her uh, for UN Behavioral Science Week in our discussion. So Professor Iris Bonet is the Albert Pratt Professor of Business and Government and the co-director of the Women in Public Policy Program at Harvard University. So she's a behavioral co economist and she combines insights from economics and psychology. Uh, she works in the areas of gender, but also cross-cultural perspectives as well. Her research looks at um, how we can use behavioral design to bias how we live. You might know her from her book, which was uh, widely, is widely known. It's called What Works Gender Equality by Design. And I think it's not only a good um, book when it comes to this topic of gender equality, but also a good introduction to behavioral science itself. So if you're looking at a book to kind of introduce you to this field, I know this has been an introduction for a number of colleagues into the behavioral science field. So I would encourage you to check it out. And Professor Bonet is not only an academic, she's also worked quite extensively in practice. So just to name a few things, uh, she's been um, uh, appointed to the Gender Equality Advisory Council of the G7. She's also been named one of the most influential academics in government by a political. So lots of, lots of impact too in her work. And lastly, but not least, she's also been the Dean of the Harvard Kennedy School. So she's done quite a lot in the last few years and we're very fortunate to have her with us today. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to her for today's session. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Bonnet, over to you. Thank you so much, Mary, for this incredibly generous introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, thank you for joining us uh, from I, I can see around the world. So I'm very excited to share a bit about our work on uh, using behavioral science to de-bias how we live, learn, and work. I will focus primarily on work today, but you'll see uh, I will touch upon kind of some broader topics as well. And with that, let me, in fact, um, share my screen. So hold on just a moment. And um, I hope that works for you all. Uh, and then kind of walk you through some slides. Uh, as Mary said, uh, my particular expertise is gender, although I just taught um, this semester actually a course on behavioral science for inclusive organizations. So that's um, an increasingly important concern, of course, for all of us to think hard about inclusion more broadly uh, beyond gender. But I will start with gender and then I'm happy to, you know, add, answer any questions that you might have uh, about how this work might transfer to other domains of difference that we all care about. So with that, um, I'm going to get right into things, and I'm going to introduce you to Heidi Rosen. Heidi Rosen is a venture capitalist, and she's on my screen here, not just because of her accomplishments, but also because a few colleagues wrote a case study about her that is now being used really around the world to teach students about the power of unconscious bias, really in a matter of seconds. So students would normally prepare this case study uh, um, as they would, you know, any other case study learning about what Heidi did, but half of the students get the case study with the protagonist being called Howard. And then they also fill out the questionnaire, which asks them about how well Heidi and Howard did and how likable Heidi and Howard are. Would you want to work with them? Would you hire them? And it turns out that time and again, we agree that both Heidi and Howard did a great job but we don't like Heidi quite as much. And again, the case study otherwise is completely identical. So what is this? Um, in fact, let me show you this uh, checkerboard here to illustrate why Heidi is kind of an opening example for me and why it's important. And by the way, I should say Heidi is real. Heidi is in fact a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley who just made up the name Howard. So now I'd like for you to look at the screen and compare squares A and B for me. And I presume that most of you, and even those of you who have read my book and have seen this checkerboard before, still see square B as being lighter than square A. 
I'm now going to cover the surroundings, and I presume that about now you realize that A and B just have the same color. I'm using um, this illustration here, of course, which is an illusion, to suggest to you that what is happening in your brain right now, namely categorical thinking, where you are making sense of the pattern that you see, is not just relevant for checkerboards, but also for people. So now I'm going to go back um, uh, for you, just to show you the original image one more time. Um, obviously, a checkerboard, and your mind tells you that a dark square just has to be next to a light square. So that's kind of logic. And you're literally unable to do justice to be if you have this pattern in the background. So we're very much arguing that this is also how you see the world and people more broadly, that you put them into boxes depending on their gender, their race, their nationality, other characteristics that you might know about them. And so um, that's, I think, an important quick insight, um, although I imagine most of you are already familiar with unconscious bias or implicit bias. The second insight that I'd like for you to take away at this point is that raising awareness by itself is not enough. Even though you now stare at the screen and try to see B for what it really is, I bet you can't. And so therefore, thirdly, I'm using these examples to suggest to us that we really do need structural interventions, we need systemic change, we need what I call behavioral design, uh, where we redesign the world in which we live for our minds to succeed, not just at this task, but at life more generally. Because what I'm doing now is I'm literally disabling your mind to see the pattern that is behind. Now, of course, not seeing the pattern is not always a solution, but it was a solution um, in a number of examples now. It's actually increasingly popular. This is an example that some of you might be familiar with already in that in the 70s, many of the US symphony orchestras started to have musicians audition behind the screen. So they literally covered uh, themselves to the demographic characteristics and that helped increase the fraction of women from about 5% in the 70s to now almost 40%. This is work by Claudia Golden and Cecilia Rouse. Um, since then, a number of organizations, countries have started to experiment with anonymous resumes. So for example, the UK government was one of the first governments to introduce this feature in their hiring process. A number of companies have done the same. And the evidence is typically supportive of the orchestra example, but not always. And as you might imagine, if uh, I lead an organization that already cares about diversity and specifically values diversity as an important ingredient in collective intelligence, if I now disable, so to speak, this feature, then that might actually backfire and decrease diversity. So the message here is that um, an important insight of behavioral science is that we have to keep testing, we have to keep evaluating uh, whatever we introduce in our organizations. But that's the journey I'd like to take you on this morning, give you a bit of a taste of how behavioral science could be applied to questions of gender equity in particular, but equity more broadly. I'm starting out with um, a concrete example of uh, research that a former doctoral student of mine, um, Catherine Baldiga Kaufman, has undertaken. She was concerned that many of our tests uh, might be biased. And she was concerned about that because many tests have the following feature. They have a component that is a multiple choice questionnaire where you have to check the right answer. Uh, you can also, um, of course, guess if you don't know the answer for sure, or you can just leave the form blank. And her fear was that even if there are tiny differences in willingness to take risk or in self-confidence across the world, so this is beyond gender, that might lead some of us to skip more questions rather than to guess. Now, of course, this wasn't a test designed to measure people's willingness to take risk. This was a test designed to measure what people know. Um, so then 
uh, she tested many different types of interventions um, and in fact did find that in the United States on the most important test that um, students have to take here, high school students have to take here, the SAT, the fact that women were skipping more than men, in fact, did cost women points on the SAT. And she tested that by bringing people to the laboratory and have them take all um, those questions in the standard SAT, but then retake the test, um, but disabled the function where you could skip the questions. We then lucked out that in 2016, the college board appointed a chair, David Coleman, who was very interested in uh, revisiting the test, not just in terms of gender equity, in terms of racial equity, English as second language, many other features. And, um, and the test actually now is uh, much more inclusive than it used to be at the time. Not perfect, but much more inclusive. And one feature that uh, was introduced was in fact to take away penalties from wrong answers to make sure that the level, the playing field really was level. Um, another quick just warm up example um, is this one. A few years ago, I got a call from the Nobel Prize Foundation. Uh, they also had realized that about 95% of all um, Nobel Prize uh, awards were given to white men. And so the question, of course, is why is that? So they invited me to Stockholm. And uh, we did a number of things. Um, I also, of course, had to sign an NDA, so many of the things I can't um, discuss now. But this is one thing, a feature that, in fact, I arrived with and that um, works as follows. So every year I receive a form that asks me to nominate one person and exactly one person for the Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, one recommendation that we had was to broaden the form and ask people like me to nominate more than one person because our research and other people's research has shown that if we make comparative evaluations and if we, we look at bundle decisions rather than one choice at a time, diversity and accuracy is much more likely to emerge. So the new form is what you have in front of you now in that uh, people like me are now asked to nominate more than one person, namely three in this case. So these are kind of easy design features, just a little to give you a bit of a taste of the types of things that we're doing. It's way beyond forms, of course. And I thought I'm now going to go a bit into talent management because I know the UN has actually done some very interesting work um, on that as well. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on hiring, although hiring remains important. I'm not trying to say it's not important, but in particular in the gender domain, one of our biggest challenges is this career advancement. So it's the pyramid that I'm doing here. My statistics by hand is this pyramid that we do have more diversity at the entry level and less at the top. I know the UN has just changed that, so that's super exciting. Um, but I have written quite a bit um, about uh, that stage. So if that interests you, there are also a number of articles available on the Harvard Business Review webpage that look at specific questions of goal setting, of interviewing, of using data. And if that's something you want to discuss, I'm very happy to go there in the Q&A. But I did want to highlight that one of the super exciting features for me that happened since the book was published that Mary mentioned in 2016 is that a number of tech startups have emerged that have taken our insights and turned them into technology, into platforms, um, and often focus on hiring, but not always focus on hiring, that help organizations de-bias their procedures. And I wanna highlight two of them in particular because I've just learned about them in the last month. So I typically now learn about a new one a week and I typically meet with them um, for half an hour just to learn about what they're doing and support their efforts. Uh, so one of them is Serang, which you have like the lower left corner um, of your screen. And that's uh, a startup that focuses on data collection and hiring uh, that was just launched in India and that I'm very excited about that you might want to check out in particular if you live in that part of the world. And then another one I wanted to highlight um, is uh, Equalis, that is a um, startup that was recently launched in Colombia that I'm also very excited about that focuses on um, again, 
collecting information and helping organizations track what they do because we know what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. Um, so as a first step, just to understand what's happening, but then also helps them um, de-bias their procedures based um, on some of the work that we're discussing today. Uh, they were launched in Colombia, I think I might have mentioned that, and their, their goal is to work all across Latin America. And to, to the best of their knowledge, but I don't know that for sure, but the best of their knowledge, they're like the first ones to really bring together behavioral science um, with technology, with um, uh, gender in inclusion in uh, India and um, Latin America. Now, I thought I'm going to end by just talking a little bit, almost end. I have one more point at the end that is important, but um, by uh, uh, pivoting now to talk a bit about career advancement and maybe just quickly give you a sense of the types of questions that we ask um, in that context. So there are, of course, biases everywhere, um, including in, in career advancement. Uh, and so that shouldn't be a particular surprise. But three I wanted to uh, highlight to you are the following. So first one is just this question of how we even measure performance. And that has become particularly salient now um, during COVID um, in that many of us worked from home. In many cases, performance could not be measured the way it was measured before. And companies had um, to, in fact, learn to not value what we call presenteeism, kind of a um, preference for us to be uh, available in person, um, wherever that might be. And I think that's an incredibly interesting moment right now to learn more about um, outcome-based performance evaluations, where we don't care as much about how and where people do the work. And that might actually benefit, uh, in particular, women, in particular, women of color in this country. Uh, so we'll see where that takes us. This is not new research. This is just um, kind of acknowledging this moment in time. And as I'm talking about this, I'm also, of course, well aware that not everyone um, uh, was able to work from home and uh, not everyone, therefore, was um, available, uh, uh, was uh, um, could, could even be think, thinking about this problem of presenteeism because they have to be present um, the whole time. Um, but that whole question of time is incredibly important for um, all jobs, really, and it just takes different forms. So uh, for the, per for the uh, workers that I've just mentioned, the frontline workers, uh, time actually is in particular relevant in terms of scheduling. So a colleague of mine here at the Kennedy School looks at that um, in depth of how important uh, the uh, some ability to control your schedule uh, is for the well-being of workers. So time definitely something for us to think about, both in terms of performance management, but also in terms of well-being. The second comment is performance support bias, uh, which is something that uh, many of you might have already experienced, certainly I have experienced it as well, in that some of us are given more support to perform. This often is not a formal process, but an informal process that I documented, um, for example, in a law firm, where a law firm uh, invited me to help them uh, devise their promotion processes. But in uh, the <clears throat> course of doing the work, we learned that it wasn't actually the process per se, that also could be improved, absolutely. But it wasn't the process per se, but it was what happened already in the very first year where these first year associates join a law firm because then partners choose people to mentor and support. And we could show that partners chose people who looked exactly like they did. And given that the partnership is not very diverse, um, at the time, 14% uh, uh, um, of the uh, partnership was non-white, non-male, non-American. Um, this was a global law firm headquartered in New York. Um, uh, so, so therefore, of course, we're replicating these biases. And then lastly, uh, performance reward bias is also something to look out for. Many organizations now do performance appraisals, do formal evaluations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the same performance score, for example, uh, translates into the same types of opportunities, into the same types of goodies. Um, my second um, kind of kind of takeaway here, beyond awareness that I mentioned before, is that awareness, as we learned from the checkerboard, is not enough. 
Um, so secondly, we do need this toolbox. Um, and that, of course, is the home of behavioral design that helps us uh, do this better. And I am I'm always kind of going back to this um, very simple acronym that the UK's behavioral insights team coined EAST in that the E stands for easy, the A for attractive, S for social, and T for timely, that a good instrument has to be EAST compatible. And now finally, um, I wanted to give you a quick example just from performance appraisals of what um, EAST uh, kind of could look like. So an easy performance appraisal process is one that typically already has a pre-designed questionnaire, language is de-biased, it's attractive, uh, where we remind employers to fill it out. It's social, that was an important improvement in this firm here of having more than one reviewer. So getting peer reviews, getting reviews from clients, customers, et cetera, and where it's much more um, frequent and that's the T in that um, feedback has to be timely. Now to close us out, um, I wanted to leave you with the following observations. So yes, we can raise awareness, that won't be enough. Again, very important, won't be enough. Um, and secondly, I do think we now have enough behavioral science to give ourselves the toolbox. But I have this uh, image up here because even though you might now see that the beach on the left-hand side is dirty, having a shovel doesn't mean that you necessarily clean the beach. We also need to worry about motivation. And that's something where behavioral science also has actually contributed quite a bit, in particular in the realm of norms. And I often think of ourselves a bit as norm entrepreneurs, where we redesign the world to help the fish move or swim in one direction. And a very simple example, but that kind of tells the story in many ways is this one here. A few years ago, we noticed that at the Kennedy School at Harvard, sadly, all of our portraits of leaders were of male leaders. And I can attest to you that this wasn't a conscious decision. Uh, we have 50% women students um, on our campus. So this is what we weren't intentionally trying to signal to women students not to become leaders, but it crept in. And we have changed the face of the Kennedy School since. This is Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former president of Liberia, also graduate of the school. So we have commissioned now a number of portraits of women, um, of people of color, um, people with disabilities, just to represent our communities and make sure that we are inclusive in the role models that we provide. And role modeling is one act um, of norm entrepreneurship because seeing really is believing. The BBC recently has done the same. This now has spread to about 150 organizations around the world where one talk show, and here we have Ross Atkins on the left, in fact, one journalist set their team a goal to get to 50-50 representation on their talk show, which they have achieved. And then this spread now across many, many organizations. So um, what I wanna leave you with is a, um, another acronym, uh, one that you're very, very familiar with, ATM, um, in that, yes, we have to raise awareness. We have to give people the tools. Um, and then thirdly, importantly, we also have to work on the motivation. If you're interested in any of the studies that we might not get to in our discussion uh, today, please check out our gender action portal. It's an online open resource that we created here at Harvard to make the research accessible for decision makers, practitioners like yourself, where we translate um, and summarize research um, for people like yourselves. It's been accessed now by more than half a million people from around the world. And with that, I'm going to close and wish you good luck designing change. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. And we took us a tour quite quickly of a lot of different areas, which is really fascinating from testing to hiring to career, um, career progression through to how do we have role models and what that might mean for organizations and for individuals as well. Um, so I see we have a number of colleagues with us today from organizations from the ILO, from DMSPC, which is the Department of Secretariat of the UN, also the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario. So colleagues, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. We have a growing number there, but as those questions are growing, I'm going to take priv my privileges here and ask a few for uh, a few myself. So the first comes from um, an initiative from the Secretary General, which has had quite prominence and importance over the last few years in particular. So in fact, 
In his oath, when he became secretary general, he spoke about gender parity, particularly in senior levels of the UN. It was it, what has been is still very much a priority of the secretary general. Um, so this, this has been achieved in the senior management group, which is all of the heads of entities and the, and the secretary general himself. Uh, also the resident coordinators of the UN, which is the individuals who lead the country offices as well. So lots of senior people, there's parity and entities themselves are also very much working in their own ways to, for gender parity as well. So my question for you is, is a little bit twofold. And you touched upon this a bit, but I'd be curious to hear more about what are biases, maybe unpacking that a bit about how role models play a role and how our biases might, um, might come into play when organizations do this and when organizations don't do this. And then also given where we are right now with the UN, the fact that we have parity, how can we be talking about this, discussing it, taking it forward in a meaningful way, other than sharing it in a, in a way that might make the most sense. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and leave it to you for your responses. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And congratulations to the UN. I mean, I have been watching this in awe. Uh, so this is amazing and super important. Um, and in fact, the best evidence on the importance of role models comes out of India, because as some of you probably know, um, India amended its constitution in 1993 to reserve a third of village head positions for women, um, including the head, the product of um, the village council or the mayor. Um, you might want to think about that. Um, similar to a mayor, not quite the same. And um, it was interesting from a research perspective because the third literally was picked out of a hat and it's a random assignment. So we can really understand causality, a very important feature of behavioral science for us to understand what difference, difference really makes, um, so beyond correlations. And um, by now, uh, about a dozen studies have been uh, done on the impact of gender diversity uh, in the local um, councils in India. And so, so there are some interesting takeaways that uh, I uh, think are also generalizable for us. Uh, one is that um, this is not the first work that shows this, but that the first woman actually has a harder time than her successors. So there is something about breaking the glass ceiling that is particularly hard and painful. So being the first is, is kind of really something. Um, what the research shows that uh, in uh, villages where uh, at least two female mayors or female pradans had been overseeing um, uh, the public policy at the local level, uh, norms are starting to change. People are starting to associate political leadership uh, with women. These women are more successful, are more likely to be reelected, are more, more likely to want to stand for re-election in contrast to the first um, women. And parents uh, start to report that a core career aspiration for their daughters is to become politicians. Now, again, you, know, you might say, well, but that's irrational. There are not that many positions um, in politics for all these girls. But that's also, of course, very much behavioral science that um, what we're falling prey to here is the availability heuristic, that something becomes available. And that's really the core message of role models, that all of a sudden something that wasn't available to me, literally available to my mind as a, um, an aspiration, um, as a possibility, uh, all of a sudden becomes available. So yes, role models are very, very important. Now, we shouldn't stop there, of course. I'm not saying in any case um, that this is the only thing we should be doing. Um, we should do many, many more things. Um, we need to devise our practice procedures. We need to create an inclusive culture, um, et cetera. But uh, seeing is believing. That evidence is incredibly strong. And it doesn't just start um, with seeing politician. It starts in the classroom. It starts with very, very young and pupils who might not see a male English teacher or a male language teacher, generally not just English, um, or a female math teacher. And so therefore don't associate um, languages or STEM with men or women respectively. So we have to make sure we offer those opportunities to everyone. Great, thank you for that. There's lots of insightful pieces in there. And it's really interesting you mentioned about this, the, the first person to go and the breaking the glass ceiling. So we often talk in, in, with you and women about the positive deviance of those women who are able to do that. What can we learn from them? And how can we maybe think about that? Like, that India is a great example of what can we learn from the situation? How can we take that forward? And, and yes, really, I mean, a bit of a personal note, I haven't worked in an organization like this before. And my, my boss is a, is a woman and it's quite inspiring and empowering to have someone like that around me. So uh, very interesting to hear about, hear about 
these examples. Okay, so I have another quick question, then we'll get to the question from the audience because we're getting quite a few come in. Um, so just, I know some a lot of colleagues with us today are working in programmatic and policy areas. So appreciating your work is not very much centered in this space. Do you have any insights or examples you might want to share about how you're able to take your, your research and apply it in more policy and programmatic settings? Yeah, um, no, no, hugely, hugely important. Um, so the, I mean, two, two quick examples, um, and but I, there are many, many more, and I know we have some colleagues from Canada you mentioned on uh, our call today. The Canadian government has done amazing work on um, gender inclusion, including on gender-based budgeting, um, including thinking about how we measure gender pay differences. Um, but I also wanted to give a shout out to, uh, I don't know if we have any colleagues from New Zealand, but I need to give a shout out to New Zealand because we recently had uh, their prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, um, at Harvard. She was the commencement speaker and uh, she was just incredibly impressive, I have to say. And again, this is probably not a surprise to many of you, but she and I had a conversation about um, equal pay for work of equal value. I know it's also something Canada has been thinking of, uh, a lot about, and that's really pushing the boundaries of um, the equal pay discussion. Um, and that, of course, uh, first, I, I should just be very clear, the equal pay discussion still is important to have, ha to have. And those of you who live in the US, and maybe even those of you who don't live in the US might have been following the um, gender um, pay um, lawsuits and negotiations between uh, the women's soccer team and the US um, Soccer Federation that now has just come to a happy conclusion where the women finally are paid um, on par with their male counterparts. Um, uh, on, on par as in with the same um, process, not necessarily on par because actually the women are so much better. So um, in, uh, in uh, so, not so, much, so much better comparatively speaking as in having been the world champions. Um, so, but in any case, uh, so equal pay for equal work is still very important. So again, we need to make sure we do that and we focus on that. But uh, once we have done that, we haven't solved all the issues yet. That's, I think, what Canada and New Zealand are reminding us of in that a big junk of the gross gender pay gap. So if you don't control for anything, if you just take um, an organization, a random, let's say, company, company X, and you count how much make, all men make in that company, and you count how much all women make, and then you divide it by the number of men and women, respectively, you get to the average. Um, if you compare those two, um, those two typically are still like 30 percentage points apart um, in many, many, many companies. And uh, you, we know because the UK now has this pay transparency law where organizations have to report their um, pay differences the way I just described to you. And um, what companies, what the good outcome actually of that law was that companies then felt compelled to try to understand where that 30 percentage points come from. Uh, because they were arguing that it doesn't come from, you know, somebody like an accountant five years into the job with the same background, a male accountant makes so much more than a female accountant, five, five years, same background. That's not what the action is. The action today is twofold. One is differences in seniority. And so we have entry level, um, more entry level diversity, as I said, less diversity typically at the top. And of course, the top makes much more money than the entry level. That's where part of that gross gender gap, right? That's uncontrolled gender gap comes from. And the second one, and that's where the equal pay for work of equal value comes in, um, is that uh, what we call occupational segregation, that we have many more women uh, study humanities um, or go into support functions and many more men study STEM or go into business functions and they on average make more money than the support functions. And so occupational segregation is an important question per se. So we also have to think about why is that, that um, girls don't go into STEM and boys don't go into nursing careers, for example. Very, very important, particularly because the care economy is one of the growth places um, globally. Uh, so we have to worry about that. But we also have to worry about why prison guards make so much more money than teachers. What, why, when, you know, how did that come to be? Is the supply and demand? Are we... Have we ever really thought about the value of work? And that's, I think, what these um, uh, two governments are really pushing at this point. 
Um, some other, you know, states like California is also on it. Um, I think that'll be very interesting to watch where this takes us. Fascinating, certainly. There's been a ton of developments just because the tour of the world. I only knew about a few of those, so I'm making notes here, jotting them down to look into the others you mentioned. Um, great, thank you so much for that. Okay, so I, I'll stop here. I just will go to the questions for the audience because I could keep asking questions about your remarks. Um, so colleagues, if you'd like to ask your question directly to our speaker, I can get, I will unmute you, but if you would not, if you prefer not to as well, that's fine. Um, so our first question is from Amelie. Um, if you'd like to ask your question, please feel free to do so. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, great. Um, so my question was more in terms of like when we, we're moving towards hybrid work with uh, some people working on sites and some people working remotely, and there might be also a, a gender differences between who decides to work remotely and, and on site. Do you have any insights as to how we ensure that performance measurements remains equitable between people who have time to put some face time with their managers and those who only have Zoom time? Um, so that was my question. Yeah, Emily, that's a very, very good question. And we certainly already see those trends that uh, women are more likely to want to have a flexible schedule um, than men. And yes, that worry that you have is real. I think what organizations have to do and have started to do, in fact, is to track uh, performance appraisals, for example, uh, not just in terms of potential gender differences or potential race differences or potential other differences that you know, shouldn't matter, sexual orientation, for example, um, but also now in terms of where the work is done. And that I think is a very important insight that uh, you know, what, what organizations have. So first of all, I should take a step back. Performance appraisals, even if we get um, organizations to focus more on outcomes, right? That's the first thing. You have to focus on outcomes, can't be presentism, can't be FaceTime. But given that we're human beings and that we know behavioral science, we do know that it's gonna be incredibly hard for managers to overcome that inclination to uh, remember more from a person who they talk to in person by the, by the you know, literal water cooler. So I think that's the first thing to say. These are not bad people. We are not bad people to be more likely to remember something that we learned from somebody we saw in person. That's our mind. So we have to take that as just a given. So that's what it's gonna, what it's gonna be. So if we have differential likelihood of meeting in person, whether that's by gender, race, or any other, you know, nationality, people might travel less, right? So we might be less likely to see our colleagues from Uganda or from Mexico than we used to. Um, uh, so, so the problem is real. Just, I just wanted to put in a marker here. So then the only question is, so what do we do with the problem? And the best thing I have seen so far is actually use the tools that an increasing number of organizations that I have been working with are now to, using in that they have these calibration meetings after managers have submitted their performance appraisals, their evaluations, and they make sure that they don't have systemic differences across race, across gender, across sexual orientation. These were the three variables that I have seen, um, ethnicity in some parts of the world, not, not race, um, that I have seen implemented. And, you know, of course it can have small differences, always. Um, and, uh, and it's not always easy to do because sometimes you have small groups and then you have five people. So the one woman in the group or the one, um, uh, Swiss in the group, uh, in my case, um, might have, in fact, um, been an inferior uh, performer. So you also have to make sure that the size is big enough. And right? so sample size is important. And so the, in that sense that this is not a recipe for everyone, but it works for organizations that have, you know, 50 people in a group, or you create the, the group that you have at least 50 people. And then it, if the 10, let's say, um, people of color in that group, Get lower evaluations than the 40 white people, that should be a red flag. And then you should go back um, to the managers or to the team leader and say, look, there's something really odd happening here. That can't be true. Could you please revisit? Um, uh, and if you know, if you want to, if you really are fighting for these differences, then you have to explain much more. Um, um, these organizations um, now do this for uh, where you work, right? So that's the same thing you can just um, control for that. Is this a person who is in the office once a week? Is this a person who is in the office five times a week? Is this a person who is not in the office at all? And are we getting systematic differences? So yeah, so tracking is gonna be very important. Thanks a lot. 
Can I just ask, Emma, are you from the food? Where are you from? Where are you joining us from? Which organization? Uh, I'm joining from FAO headquarters. Okay. Food and Agricultural Organization. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Okay, so now on to another one, which is very highly <laughs> voted in the chat in the Q&A box here. So it's from Loan, I believe from DPPA. Can you please, please um, unmute yourself? Or, or if you'd like to ask your question, if not, I can ask it for you. I think you've joined by a few devices, so I'll, I'll try to. If not, I can also ask it. Yeah, yeah, hi, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bonnet. Loni yes, and I am from uh, Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs uh, in the Policy and Mediation Division. And I'd like to ask whether any of your work has been applied to conflict context here, uh, especially looking at the lack of women in political decision-making processes um, amongst conflict parties to, to peace processes, which is, which is an area that's very hard to, um, affect change it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, so I have not, but other people's other people have. So you might want to check out the work by Elizabeth Pallock, uh, P-A-L-U-C-K, Elizabeth. She is a professor at Princeton. She's a psychologist. And she has done some really, really interesting work um, applying behavioral science uh, to uh, conflict areas, in particular to reconciliation processes. So I don't know whether she has specifically looked at, thank you for that, um, in the chat, Johanna. Um, I don't know whether she has specifically looked at representation and the difference that um, uh, gender parity, for example, would make on the negotiation teams, uh, which I think is what you have in mind. But she has uh, looked at other questions. I'll give you just one example, which I was very intrigued with, and I still am very intrigued with, where she looked at Rhonda and at um, the Hutus and the Tutsis, and whether anything that we could say these days, um, uh, and this is uh, you know, more 10 years ago, so these days isn't quite literal, literal but post-conflict could help them um, with reconciliation. And she um, tested a number of interventions, including a radio program, where um, uh, examples were shared. So it's a little bit seeing is believing, where examples of sh were shared of Hutus and Tutsis collaborating. And uh, she found many interesting things, but the one thing I wanna leave you with, which I, I think is kind of a broad, more broadly relevant for us, is that um, uh, interestingly enough, the, the people were listening to those radio programs in, in groups, so collectively, um, kind of in the town square, and it changed their norms. It, it changed what they thought was acceptable behavior um, across uh, conflict lines. It didn't change their attitude. So they didn't say, oh, you know, I now love my sister. I love my brother who is, you know, from a different um, ethnic background. But it changed what they thought the new Rwanda should look like um, and what the types of norms that should be upheld look like. And I, I do think that's in particular for conflict, but also more generally, a kind of important takeaway that um, I had to slide up that we all are norm entrepreneurs in our organizations. And, you know, we shape uh, what is acceptable, whether microaggressions are being tolerated, whether interruptions are being tolerated, where not being given credit for a comment is being tolerated, um, whether uh, you know, uh, aggressive behavior in a conflict um, uh, negotiation uh, uh, context, for example, is being tolerated. So uh, I, I do think everyone, in fact, could become a norm entrepreneur, um, uh, independent of their gender or their, their racial background. So that doesn't have to be, you know, a woman, of course. But we do find generally that people who have um, experienced uh, marginalization or exclusion, um, which is more likely to be a woman or which is more likely to be a person of color or which is more likely um, to not be a heterosexual person, they tend to be more sensitive in those contexts, kind of, you know, more sensitive to the micro behaviors um, that um, might be espoused. So in that sense, uh, I, you know, I imagine it would make a difference, but I don't actually um, as I have not done any research myself on that. 
Great. Thank you for your question and for your answer. I, Johanna, as you mentioned, Johanna put some of the links in the chat there. So if you're curious to learn more, I encourage you to check out, check out those. Um, but very, very good point. I think we often focus on behaviors and behavioral science, but there's a lot of before that when it comes to beliefs and thoughts. And it's, it's great that you touched upon that as well. Okay, so now on to, I see Lucy Martin has, has a couple of questions here. Lucy, I can unmute you or allow you to talk if you'd like to ask your questions directly. You'll need to unmute yourself. If not, that's fine as well. I can also ask them for you. Okay. Um, so since part of our gender biases are unconscious, what happens when we explicitly acknowledge bias? Does it help uh, people make better decisions or is there a backlash effect? For example, if people are being offended by the idea that they might be biased. Mm. That's um, a very, very interesting question. And I don't know we have the final answer at this point yet. And I'll give you... Um, two approaches to unconscious bias. Um, so there's definitely research supporting exactly what you're saying in that um, very hard to acknowledge that you are a sexist or a racist um, and, and people might shut down. People might become defensive and kind of, you know, run the other direction or might even, you might even experience backlash and there is evidence for that. And so personally, um, and this is just me as a person rather than a researcher kind of trying to communicate this message um, I um, purposely use the checkerboard at the beginning because it's kind of a benign way for people to learn about stereotypes where I don't have to point fingers um, at anyone. And I'm also always trying to make it clear, which again is very based on research, uh, that this is not about men or not about women or not about whites um, or blacks or um, Hispanics or uh, Latinos. Um, or Asian um, uh, people with an Asian background. Um, but it is about all of us as human beings that generally we overestimate um, the importance that our own characteristics play. Generally, these stereotypes are shared. So the, the, the story that I typically um, share is when my husband and I dropped off our son at a daycare center um, and the person we met there, the first person we met there was a male, um, caregiver and we both at that just for a moment thought like oh my god you know this is the end of the world it didn't last very long and we caught ourselves um, um experiencing that bias and of course it was amazing everything but it, i think it, it it happens to all of us and it, it's not because my, my husband was male he was protected from experiencing that bias against the male um caregiver so um it, it, yes, so so the the um, backlash can happen. Now I'll give you so that's my so that's why I do it more benignly because I want um, what I call unfreeze. Um, I'm uh, borrowing that from um, a famous psychologist, Kurt Lewin, who talked about change management, and he he always says, you know, you have to unfreeze first, then you have to change, and then you have to refreeze, and that's where behavioral science coming comes in, right? Then you have to give the tools, the, the systems, and you have to really institutionalize this. Um, but for this whole thing to happen, you have to unfreeze. So my personal unfreezing strategy is benign one. Now, other people, um, and that research is just at the beginning, but have cautioned me and said, well, but couldn't it be that if you, so to speak, normalize bias and you're saying, well, it is about all of us, you give us the license to be biased. Um, and that's something I have to be careful about. Right. So when I communicate, I don't want to communicate that um, because it's about all of us, um, it's the right thing to do. Um, and that so, so that's a little bit I'm just giving you the tension here between uh, kind of pointing fingers versus, you know, not pointing fingers at myself and maybe therefore um, nor normalizing the types of behavior. I think that's what we have to look out for. Um, and the last thing I would say is, uh, you know, just again, this is maybe more negotiation than um, behavioral decision science, but I used to teach negotiation. It's incredibly important um, to build coalitions. It is important to have allies. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if we think about gender, it is important to have male allies uh, in our organizations who become the ones who raise their hands and say, oh, you know, Mary, um, I think, uh, 
we just kind of jumped too quickly over the comment that you just made. Uh, why don't we come back to it? Because it was really interesting and we didn't quite um, spend enough time on this. Um, it shouldn't just be the women or the people of color who have to carry all that water. Um, so in that sense, I also think strategically speaking, I want to make sure everyone is invited to this conversation. And I, in that sense, I feel it is um, easier, you know, for maybe particularly st uh, straight white men who have, who might not have had some of these experiences, to really be invited in the discussion, but with that inv invitation also to be given some responsibility for the new normal that we're trying to create. Great, thank you for that. Very inspiring and definitely definitely resonates with a lot of the, the discussions that we've had. So in the few minutes left here, I think we can maybe squeeze in one last question uh, from Mum Taz. Would you like to ask your question? Hi, thank you so much. And um, um, we've been talking a lot about personal biases and I wanted to hear a little bit about systemic bias because we, we see a lot of this, especially in the UN system. So I am working with uh, UNAIDS, I'm based in Argentina, I'm sorry, I should have started with that, um, working on culture transformation in UNAIDS. Um, so the question is really around how do we manage systemic bias? So the example I've given is in recruitment, we use what we call competency-based recruitment. So the interviews, uh, tests, everything is based on the competencies required for the post. Uh, but this does not take into account the differences, and you can look at culture differences, gender differences, you know, differences based on your, you know, lived experiences, etc. Et uh, how can we address this issue? How can we improve in this area, in the sense that you don't want to, you know, unbalance the, the the process, but also you want to take into account people's realities and lived experiences uh, based on their, you know, diverse backgrounds into that yeah. process. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. And I, I have to tell you, I feel I might have not done a great job. If you think that my work is primarily about individual bias, it's actually not. It's all about systemic bias. So um, what I am arguing is that individual biases translate into our systems because we have been creating those systems and we have not worked on debiasing our systems enough. And so all my work is actually on debiasing systems. So I, I'm not saying we should change our mindsets. We can't. Um, we should fix people. We can't. Um, we should fix systems. So I just wanted to make that very, very clear. Um, but you now ask a very specific question. And I think there are two answers to your question. Um, one is the answer that I gave before about the, you know, uh, virtual work, hybrid work versus um, in-person work. And um, the same is true for the tools that we use. We just have to measure, we have to calibrate, we have to understand whether um, our tools have, as the US legal system calls it, differential impact on people from different backgrounds. So maybe a, you know, it's a spelling test. You're not using spelling, but I'm just saying. Obviously, if we use the spelling test um, for somebody who might want to become my executive assistant, somebody for whom English is their second language, as it is in my case, that um, might actually turn out um, not to be a great instrument because I will be disadvantaging people um, whose English might not be as strong. Um, so we have to always calibrate. Now, the counter argument that you might now in your minds um, that might now you're thinking about is, well, but you know, maybe English is crucial for the job. Maybe maybe you need somebody who, who spells correctly. And I think that's that balance, right? That we always have to strike. That, um, it, that we have to kind of certain things are just requirements that you need for the jobs. But then many, many others are just add-ons that we created because of unconscious bias again, but also just because habit, because that's always what we have been doing. So that's why it's very important to, to measure our instruments. And in fact, you know, funnily enough, that's where we can learn from AI, because I think the way for AI is to always evaluate any new AI tool on disparate impact before it is unleashed on the world. Um, but that, of course, is not just for AI. Any tool 
that we're unleashing on the world, we have to test for disparate impact and then kind of make those calls. The last thing, and I know we're out of time, so just very quickly, of course, um, I'm also not arguing that organizations can fix everything. Um, it starts, you know, um, systemic um, bias and systemic disadvantage starts, of course, much, much earlier. So we do have to work with schools. We do have to start much earlier to create inclusive learning um, so that uh, uh, students from all kinds of different backgrounds can, in fact, compete for the jobs that you are talking about. And if you're interested in that more holistic approach, I want to leave you with one more um, recommendation. It's also publicly available. It's called the ACT Report. It's Action to Catalyze Tech. This was a group of um, behavioral scientists, tech um, leaders, um, people from the political um, arena that worked together for about a year to really think about the employee, not just employee life cycle, but the holistic framework of what happens in our schools, what happens with our products that we design and what happens in, in our organizations in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion. It's also broader than gender. It really is about diversity, equity, inclusion. And it's a bit of a roadmap of um, where we would uh, need to go in order to really create equity for everyone. Great, thank you very much for that. I think there's a lot of, of useful insights in there. Um, so we could try to find that resource and share as we can as well. So with that, I think we've gone over our, our time for today, um, but thank you very, very much for joining us and for this very interesting discussion. I'm sure we could have gone on for much longer. There are uh, more questions still, still to be addressed, but um, if you have questions or comments, feel free to follow with us or Professor Bonet and her, her research in, in, in Harvard as well. And her book, I think, as we've spoken before, covers a lot of this in much more detail. So if you're keen on exploring these topics, I would encourage you to check that out. So with that, would you like to say anything else before we close out for today, Professor? Or? No, just thank you. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I know many of you work in very complex environments. I've done some work with various parts of the UN before. Um, and I just wanted to applaud you for um, the resilience that you have um, shown always, but also particularly during these past two years. Great, thank you so much. So with that, so we'll conclude for today and hopefully this is part of a continued discussion as we go forward. So thank you so much everyone for joining and hopefully see you at some other events throughout the week. Okay, bye now everyone. <laughs>